And I think too, I love that you highlight you can't heal it outside of community. And that's because as individuals, it's highly unlikely, even in our self-talk, that has always come from somewhere. So we're not hurting ourselves and then be like, hey, now I have to heal myself. We're getting hurt by ideas, concepts, society, community. We're getting hurt, quotes around hurt, but we're getting hurt by other people coming back, self-healing, self-loving, and not taking on that rejection from those other people and then solidifying that self-love and that self-healing in a community again, because it can't live without other people to help it actually grow and come outside of that. It's started by community, it's healed by you, and then healed by community as well. Hello and welcome to another episode of Solidarity Sister with Kristen Wilson. I am really excited for you to get to listen to this conversation today. Taylor Proctor is an incredible business coach. She has both corporate experience, wedding planner experience, all kinds of marketing experience, and has the ability to help people get good at business. She is a gift to entrepreneurs and helping them to see the way forward when they have these ideas. She is a community builder. She is concerned with being in a space where all ships rise. And you know, going into this, I was kind of like, what are we going to talk about? I mean, obviously we're going to talk about community because that is the basis of everything here at Solidarity Sister. But also, I am a mainly stay-at-home mom with eight kids who my life is, you know, engrossed a lot with motherhood. And Taylor is a single professional. She has some phenomenal family relationships, close friend relationships, but a lot of her time and energy goes to her business. And I was not surprised even one bit to see just how much we connected. We don't need to come from the same backgrounds to spend our days in the same way to find meaningful connections. I loved hearing Taylor's story about how she was wounded in business relationships and how fast forward she was healed in a business community. Oh, it's just such a great story. I can't wait for you to hear that part. You will be inspired by Taylor's vitality her energy, the care in which she invests herself into community and to listening to the ideas of other people. You're just going to be so inspired and I guarantee you're going to love her laugh. Welcome to another episode of Solidarity Sister and today I am bringing you Taylor Proctor, who is a business coach. I love her energy. I'm actually getting to talk to her for the first time, kind of face to face, thanks to Zoom. But I have been watching her on Facebook and we've connected there. And I'm excited to see what she brings to the table today. So, Taylor, tell me to begin, how are you doing today for real? I'm doing really good, except for I am in my car. And I was hoping that the weather would be nice because I own a convertible. <laughs> so I was hoping the weather would be warm and I could have the top down. But we have the top up. It's a little cold outside. But ultimately, I am really, really good. I'm loving life and happy to be on the show today. I love that. That's awesome. I'm happy to have you here. So I just want to dive into community a little bit and talk to you about like you're building this business community online. You have your podcast. You have coaching. Where are you finding community these days personally, or is there a lot of overlap with your business and with, with your personal life? How is that all working together for you? Where does community come in? So community for me really comes in two forms. And the first is of course, family. I'm very blessed to have a family with me locally. And while they don't know what I do, <laughs> it's really funny. Actually, one time my mom told me, she said, yeah, I was talking to so-and-so at my work and they asked what you do. And I said, you build websites. And I was like, mom, I don't, I mean, I can, but I don't build websites, <laughs> but I help with building websites and the marketing and the operations and all these things. I'm like, I help with business kind of in this robust way, but I thought it was really funny because she thought I built websites. So they don't really know what I do, but they are still super supportive. And in fact, I, 
I have a brother-in-law and a sister that are just amazing and they do know what I do and they're like, yes, this is fantastic. And there's such a great support base and amazing people to go and talk to and create that community just in a small sense. And then the other one is in a personal friendship. So I am blessed to have several business owner friends where we get together and have lunch once a month or dinner once a month. And we just chat and we get together. I'm in a group right now where there's three of us and we're hosting a challenge for ourselves about the next 90 days and what we want. And it's just all completely organic and natural and just putting in the time to be there and support one another. And I absolutely love that. And I don't need on a very personal level, I don't need massive amounts of community to feel supported. A few really good friends, good family as a support base, like that is all I need. And for my business, I'm really trying to create a community and have created a community where entrepreneurs can learn from each other to get good at business. And so it really is an opportunity to see how other individuals are growing their businesses, how they're working within the I move method, which stands for intuition, marketing, operations, velocity, and execution, which is my proprietary method. But when you're learning how other people are doing their marketing, even if it's a completely different industry, you're like, oh, could I apply that to my business? And you're learning about how they're putting these things in place for their operations. And you're like, mm, I haven't been doing that. I could do that and probably get way more efficient and less burnt out. And so there's opportunities within the communities that I'm building on the business side that are really about growth and impact and community with other entrepreneurs and business owners. So all ships can rise together. But for me personally, I'm doing great today and I really like my more intimate type of community base and support. I love that. And there are some really important key takeaways for me there. Number one, I don't know if you've heard James Clear of Atomic Habits. He's been interviewed so many times. And at one point, I know there was an interview where people had asked him over a long period of time, what is the most important habit? And he didn't know until he got further in the process. And then he said that the most important habit had to do with who you spent your time with, who you made a habit of hanging out with. And what I'm hearing you say is that the people in your very inner circle, your family and your very closest friends are people that are supportive, that are inspiring to you, that have your back, that are helpful and that want to help you rise together. I love that you have these two friends and you're doing this 90 day challenge together just because you are people who want to grow together. And so you're spending your time, your energy, your habits with people that are helping you to be your best self. And at the same time, you're then creating this larger business community that has the same principles going. Let's yeah. all hang out together in a community of people who want to have impact in a positive way in the world and want to lift each other where all ships rise, as opposed to sometimes business can be really cutthroat, very cutting, either the old boys club that's trying to shut everyone out or, you know, all the different facets to business that are ugly. The people who go to church on Sunday and then are very underhanded in business all week long because they can and they think that's how business should be. And I love the model that you're creating, which is totally different than that, but still provides so many avenues for success. Absolutely. And I'm I'm a huge proponent of community over competition, right? Community over comparison, because there is more than enough for everyone. And if we can stand in our morals and our ethics and be in integrity and help each other and help our clients. Again, all ships rise with that. And to me, that is the the most important thing. I think that's so beautiful. And, and really what we should all want, right? Isn't that like the key to world peace right there? <laughs> Just this yeah. idea that we want to be in alignment with our own integrity and we want to lift other people as we go and allow other people to lift us because we can't do it alone. There's yeah. so much more power. All of these entrepreneurs and business owners that are coming together in your community, they're doing great things on their own. But as you mentioned, they're finding ideas and inspiration within this broader community that they can then take back to their own personal lives and be that much better. 
Absolutely. without having to work so hard. Like we want to be hard workers. We don't want to be hard workers to burn out. <laughs> right, right. And it's fascinating too, because I feel like there is this, this gap between where we want to be and what we're actually doing. Right. And as entrepreneurs, we, where we want to be is we want to be having the clients and we want to be having the freedom both financially and time wise. But then where we actually are is this stuck in, I'm doing it all by myself. I have to figure this out on my own. And one of the things that I actually just did a video on this today is one of the biggest hindrance for entrepreneurs, especially in their first one to three years, is that they don't talk about their business enough, like to everyone, because you never know, right? You're at, you're at a church function and you're talking to somebody and you're like, yeah, I have a business and I do this, this, and this. And they're like, wow, actually my sister could really use something like that, right? You never know my coworker, whoever, you never know who could make connections and help you facilitate even more relationships in your business. And so we really have to have the opportunities to talk about our businesses and do it in a safe space like a community that is meant to have all ships rise because that can help you grow your business, grow your confidence and grow the community. Oh, I think that's fantastic. And I and honestly, I love being the person who gets to make the connections. If I have friends who have been sharing things on social media about whatever the thing that they're doing is, and then I have another friend that's like, hey, I'm kind of looking for help with this. I love using Facebook Messenger for three-way messages and being like, hey, Susie, you need to meet Sarah because you're looking for exactly what Sarah does in her business. Sarah, meet Susie. And then I like quietly exit the chat because I've done my thing, you know, that is, it's so rewarding to be able to do that. But I couldn't do that if Susie wasn't already being vocal about what she was doing, because then I wouldn't know. And so even though I would hear that Sarah had this need, I wouldn't be able to do that. Even in just in small ways, I have a friend who's actually named Sarah, but is in, in my <laughs> community and she does the most beautiful furniture refinishing. And she posts about it online. Like, here's another piece that I did and here's what I did. And then a friend in my neighborhood was like, I have this antique sewing table that belonged to, it was either her mother or her grandmother. And she wanted it refinished to really use it, but it was so sentimental. Hey, Karen, meet mm -hmm. Sarah. And she was able to finish the table. And it was so fun for me to just have this tiniest little piece to being able to connect them. Because even though we're all in the same community, they didn't know each other. Right. It came out beautifully and it was just fun. So that gives an opportunity for those of us who don't have a business. You can still be a connecting piece and help people bring value to each other just by being aware, just by paying attention. So 100%. People that are master connectors are so amazing. Like that is not a skill that I have, <laughs> right? Or just being able to boop, boop, boop. Oh yes, this person, this person, this person, let's connect. Like, and I try hard, I'm working on it, but that in its own right is such a unique and needed skill set to help not just business owners, but like you said, help within the community, help cultivate friendships, help solve needs. So much of that is important and such a vital piece of any community. Oh, I agree with you. I've even done it for things that weren't business related that, you know, I have some friends that have EDS, ehlers danlos Syndrome, and then a couple of other friends who have come out and said, we've just been diagnosed with this. And it's not talked about very often and people don't know a lot about it. I still don't know a lot about it but I know who the people are that know about it. So I've done those three-way messages. Hey, you just got this diagnosis and you're reeling. These guys are like veterans in this area. They can help you and they're happy to because they wish that someone had done that for them. Right. So they are fantastic resources. And it's, it's great to be able to make those connections. I don't know. So I did not think that that was anything that was a rare skill. So thank oh, it you. Is. <laughs> I was like, doesn't everyone do that? Like sometimes the things that, that come to us naturally, we undervalue. We really do. And it's it's funny because I I have a friend who I keep on telling her, I'm like, you should make being a con master connector a business, right? It's almost like a concierge of this is your problem. I can connect you with this person and then with this person. 
and it really can transform the relationship and then they just get paid on the referral basis. And she's like, yeah, I could do that. And I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it is a skill that is amazing. And for someone who doesn't have it naturally, I can't remember people. And I'm like, I know somebody who does something that can help you, but I've got to go back and look through my messages or look through my Facebook and figure out who it is that I remember that could help you. Whereas I feel like master connectors are like, oh, boom, boom, boom. Here you go. Connected. And so even just the memory piece is a huge bonus and advantage. I'm not sure why that works for me because I cannot remember when my children vocalized requests for the grocery store. The rule in our house is if you want something, you have to text mom. You have to put it in writing because if you don't, I will get there and I will forget. I did it yesterday to one of my kids. She said, but I told you. And I said, yes, you did. You verbalized it. I need it in writing. I'm sorry. I'll get it next time. <laughs> so I cannot remember everything, but somehow I can remember who is good at things and be able to use that when someone else needs something. So is there like a that. time where you have been through a darker, more difficult period So you show up with such light and energy and life is good and I'm living my best life, but is there ever been a time where there's been some trials you faced, some darkness where community has had an impact on you? Yes. And I would say it has an impact. Community has had an impact in two ways. So I used to be corporate. So I am an entrepreneur now. I'm a business owner, but I spent 15 years in corporate in marketing, operations, leadership, strategy, et cetera. And oftentimes it would be throw me the keys of an idea and I would take it and make it work. So in one of the companies I was working for, I was there for three years and we had incredible growth. They said, here's an idea. And so we went from in a three-year period, from zero employees, team members to 30, from one service that we offered to five, from one language to five languages. I call it, I kind of call it five and a half because we had Spanish, which was North American Spanish and South American Spanish. And then we also had Spain Spanish, so European Spanish. So five languages, five and a half. And I even spent six weeks living in Edinburgh, Scotland, setting up our EMEA, our European team. So grew this department from zero to all of that to millions of dollars in revenue. And it was absolutely incredible. And you see that a lot with intrapreneurs, which are entrepreneurs in a corporate setting, which is exactly what I was, where you see this rapid growth and all of these pieces are falling into place. You're growing your team, you're growing your support, all of that. And we'd really create a community within the team. That's part A. <laughs> so. Part B is I had two team members and I'll be real transparent here. I have no idea what they got in their head, but they had assumed that for some reason I was out to fire everybody on the team. And logically, I'm like, I don't know how you guys could think that because this is my team. I've built it from scratch over three years. The last thing I would do to any of you and to myself is start completely over. So why are you telling everyone on the team that I want to fire everyone? Like none of that makes any sense. Logically. I don't know how that idea got in their head, but they decided that they were going to go to Twitter and TikTok and to the team and the department that I was in charge of and tell everyone what a terrible, horrible person I was. And it was devastating for so many reasons because when you're in leadership positions like that and I'm naturally one of my skills that I tend to diminish but I'm really good at is that I am naturally a leader and doesn't matter where I'm at I can be if it's a group of people next thing you know I'm the leader which is probably why I also have a very small set of community for like my deep rooted support because I don't have to step into leadership Whereas the larger the group, the more it's expected that I'm a leader. And I know that sounds weird. It just naturally happens. So that said, being someone who naturally is put into leadership positions and being someone who had grown this department from zero to 30 employees and had done all of this work and all of this growth and had really invested, like it wasn't just, oh, we did the job, invested so heavily in culture and mental and emotional well-being for my team members and 
to help this get to be the place where we had d- the most diverse department. That was my goal. And I actually had told one of my colleagues, I said, I would put a month's salary that we have the most diverse team in the entire global company. And that's not just diverse in like a typical diversity space, but diverse of passion, diverse of thought. And when you hire for diversity of passion and thought, you get diversity in all the other areas as well. And so I was super proud of that and proud of the culture that we had built. And to have two team members really try to take me down was so devastatingly hard. And to have put in so much as a leader into those two people individually and had had meetings and coaching and promotions and all of these things to have them what felt like turn on me. And to this day, I don't know what flipped the switch. I don't know if I actually did something. I don't know if somebody said something to him. I, I have no idea. But it wrecked me. And I had what I would call leadership hangover for at least two years. Where anytime I was in a large group of people and it was called on me to lead, I was like, no, I don't want to do it. Nobody wants to hear from me. Nobody wants to listen to me. And it was so difficult. And I actually, we let those two team members go because they had gone online and we have clients and things that are seeing these and like, we can't have that. And it was also causing a lot of issues in the department. And once they were gone, the remaining 28 were like, oh, it's not actually what they said it was. I'm like, no, it wasn't. And then then everything got right back on track and was totally fine. (laughs) But it still gave me a leadership hangover and I actually moved to a different company. I was headhunted to a different company a few months after that. So I didn't get like the the story arc of like, okay, that really sucked. But the rest of the teams behind me, they were and it was a community part there. But then when I went to this other company, I didn't have the leadership growth or scalability that I had in this other spot. And so I lived with this leadership trauma for quite some time. And the thing that helped me get through it was community on the other side, which is community of entrepreneurs and business owners. And I'll never forget. It was one of the coolest experiences of my life. I went to a conference and I was pretty well known in this community that was attending this conference. I went to this conference twice and They would do this activity that was a frame and it had all these strings and there was a great big hole in the middle that was about chest high and I'm five, six, five, seven, and five, seven, five, six and three quarters. (laughs) Anyways, and so it was about chest high for me. So it's not the kind of thing you can just like jump through or just step through. It's pretty high. And the whole goal of it is, is that you lift up all everybody who's there and they have to go through this frame and the strings and this hole in the strings one by one. And if they touch the strings or touch the frame, then they're out. So first time that I did this, (laughs) I was like, okay, well, let somebody else handle it. Next thing you know, I'm up on a chair and I'm telling everybody where to go and what we need to do to get through this. And people were listening and it was amazing. And it was an audience, both of men and women. And it was so incredible to me because Women listening to women is one thing, but sometimes you come up against men who have an attitude, a problem with a woman in charge and you don't come against that regularly, but just, you know, every so often. And so it was incredible to like lead this group of people through this exercise. And we had a time limit. We had 60 people. We had to get through this frame in 30 minutes and we only lost 11, which is phenomenal. For a group of people who don't know each other, who had this thrown on them. But afterward, because of my like leadership trauma, I was a mess. Because I was so distraught that like I took over. Nobody wanted me to lead. Nobody wanted me to, nobody wanted to listen to me. They just did. Like I just told myself all of these stories and I was a wreck. So then I had to like really work through that for myself on my own. Well, the next time, similar conference, same kind of community. And I said, I refuse. I will not step in and lead this group. I will not, will not. And it was all in my head, all the other things I was saying before. I was like, I will not do it, but I'll participate. Somebody else can lead and I'll just 
you can lift me up and put me through the strings. <laughs> so they say go. And keep in mind, this is a very similar community to the first one. So a lot of people were at that first one. And the next thing you know, I hear people going, Taylor, Taylor, where's Taylor? Taylor, Taylor, where we need Taylor? Bring Taylor into the middle. And I'm like, I'm not saying anything. And a gentleman came and very gently grabbed me by the arm and said, what are you doing? We need you to lead us. And pulled me into the center and like then kind of gently pushed. And there were other people like pushing me as he was gently guiding me into the middle of this group of people. And they all said, tell us what to do. And that was so earth shattering for me because here was this community that really was saying, we want to learn from you. We want to be led by you. We want to be encouraged by you. We want to hear from you, which I had never had a problem with before. But since I had those two team members just turn, everything shifted for me. And so this community on the other side really supported me in stepping back into leadership. And even now, I have a small team that I work with for my business, and that's amazing. And I don't have any problems leading them. But even now, like I can step into next levels of my business and go on podcasts like this and communicate and create content because I'm not afraid of leadership anymore because I can say, People do want to hear from me. People do want to be guided by me. People are interested in what I have to say and how it can help them. And anytime that I start to get in my head about that, I'm like, nope, remember that event and that community where you were literally pushed and pulled to lead people because they wanted me to be that person for them. And it's my honor to be able to do that. But really community helped me work through that in a way that I never would have been able to otherwise. I love, I love so much about that. First of all, I am sorry that happened to you. And yes, that would be absolutely devastating because that's betrayal. That is a form of betrayal trauma. You have invested your heart, your soul, your energy into building this thing and creating this department where people feel seen and heard and appreciated and the synergy you have. I love diversity. I love bringing people who aren't having my life experience onto my podcast. I love my Facebook feed because like literally anytime there's a conspiracy theory, I have the actual conspiracy theorists on my feed and the people who are anti-conspiracy theory. They're like all in there. And I actually love that because I learn so much more about the world and about myself by not being in echo chambers. I like having all these different ideas. And so you've done this, you've created this thing. And then to have these two people not even have like just office gossip, but to go on social media, like for the love of all things, that is so unprofessional. Are you kidding me? How did they think it would end? Like, obviously they're going to be let go. I, I don't even care. Even if what they had was valid, like if it was valid enough that you need a lawsuit, then you go file a lawsuit, right? You, you can do something about it. You don't have to just be silenced. However, that's just stirring the pot. That's just bringing down the morale of everyone. And it would be devastating. And maybe if you hadn't left that company to go to the other space that you were headhunted to, maybe that time would have healed within that community as you saw that the remaining 28 people could look to you and could appreciate that. But I really am finding the more that I talk to people about their life experiences, whether we're in business, whether we're in families, whether in friend dynamics or nonprofits, I don't care where you are, the wounds that we suffer within community never heal in isolation. No. They always heal in community. You might need a new community. You might need a different community. You might need, if you were wounded within a marriage partnership, you might need a different partner. It might not be that the person who wounded you is the person who heals you. But if you are wounded in a relationship within community, the healing, the real healing only comes within community. So yes, it's important to do the personal work. And honestly, self-love and self-care is that is all at the heart of building healthy communities. Because if we don't do that for ourselves, then we show up in a way where we're telling ourselves all these stories. We're not relating well. We're not emotionally regulating ourselves. We're not 
being able to be present with what is, but we're bringing all of our baggage and all of those lenses into all of our interactions. So clearly the personal work does matter. It is a value, but the actual moments of healing end up happening in community. They just do. Other they people have to. Have to, they have to do that for us. We cannot do it entirely ourselves. We have to be able to reach out. And I love that those people were like, no, Taylor, you're good at this. Like this, this is what we need you for. This is your time. Get out there and shine, like do it. And that, that, that healed that for you sufficiently enough too, that then you could move forward and create the container you've created now and create what you're doing now, because that part of you was healed enough to be able to move forward. I love that. I love that you shared that. And I think too, I love that you highlight, you can't heal it outside of community. And that's because as individuals, it's highly unlikely, even in our self-talk, that has always come from somewhere. So we're not hurting ourselves and then be like, hey, now I have to heal myself. We're getting hurt by ideas, concepts, society, community. We're getting hurt, quotes around hurt, but we're getting hurt by other people coming back, self-healing, self-loving, and not taking on that rejection from those other people, and then solidifying that self-love and that self-healing in a community again, because it can't live without other people to help actually grow and come outside of that. It's started by community, it's healed by you, and then healed by community as well. Absolutely. I think that's that's just, I, I didn't actually anticipate that being the case when I started this podcast, but it's been interesting. The more people I interview, the themes that could just come out. Yeah. Just seeing like, I feel like the tiniest little bit, like a Brene Brown, like I can be like you, I can take the stories and I can gel the patterns that come out of all of the stories across a broad diversity of experiences. Brene Brown is like, one of my heroes. So like anytime I can be like, I'm almost being like you in the very smallest little piece, but you could but be a if, community researcher. Yes. <laughs> because that's really so much of what she does is she takes people's stories and, and she's done so much with shame and vulnerability. And I feel like that's, I'm, I'm now a community researcher. I didn't even know that was a thing, but here I am. So it's kind of fun, you know, I love it. I love it. <laughs> hit your forties and do something different and who knows, maybe I'll do something different in my fifties or sixties. I actually have this vision of riding a pink Vespa when I'm like in my sixties, seventies, eighties to get around town. I don't know why, but that's just like, I want to be like the old lady that makes people smile. Cause they're like, Oh my gosh, look at her. And I'll be like, yeah, it's yeah, just me on my pink Vespa. I don't know I why. I love that. I love that. And I, I'm all about crazy colored vehicles. I don't know if you can tell behind me, but my car is orange <laughs> and I love driving around and being in my orange car and people being like, what, what's going on there? So I love that from a, as you're older, drive your pink Vespa. So fun. I love that. Well, right now I actually drive a brown 12 passenger Nissan because of all of my kids. This isn't like my dream car, but when we went to the dealership and we looked at all of the color options, I actually picked this color because I was like, that's the one that looks like dirt. And children are so dirty. So <laughs> I really like the red one. I really like the blue one. They're kind of fun. I like black, but black is harder to keep clean because it just is. It shows everything. I never wanted white because white represented like either a contractor or a kidnapper van. So white was like out of the question. That was a no for me. Then I'm like the brown one. I mean, they made it sound pretty. It was like some mocha latte or some whatever. I don't know. They gave it some name. And I'm like, no, it's brown with a little glitter. I'm like, that's the one that will hide the dirt. So this is not the vehicle that necessarily embodies my personality spunk, but it is the practical choice for this decade and change. We've had it for a decade now, which is kind of crazy. But someday. That, that'll make the pink Vespa all the more worth it. It will, because then I'll be like, yes, this is for me. It is me on my pink Vespa, which will, you know, be so funny because I have never actually ridden a Vespa in my life. But in my imaginings for myself, that's where I'm headed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So tell me, Taylor, my favorite question. There were a billboard that everyone in the world would see and you got to decide what went on that billboard. 
what do you think the world needs to hear? So I'm going to speak specifically to the audiences that I work with the most, because I think that there are some universal truths to the world, but also there is not enough information for the individual. So if I was putting something on the billboard, this would be my combination of that, where here's something to inspire you on an individual level, if this is you. And also if it is you, then there's a whole community of people that this could speak to which is you can get good at business. I know so many business owners and entrepreneurs that they want to get good at business so they can get back to the heart of why they got into business in the first place. And then they struggle with the confidence and they struggle with like, what are the next steps and how do I actually do this? And I just wish I could get good at business. And the truth of it is, is that it starts with the knowledge that you can get good at business and to keep trying or keep going. So- if I had a billboard, because there's limited space on those, like they usually say you only have eight words max, right? It's you can get good at business. There's my six words. Oh, I actually think that's phenomenal because I think about, so I was diagnosed with ADHD at age 41 and so many of the things that I want to do and the big ideas, and there are a lot of entrepreneurs who have ADHD. So we have these great big ideas and things that we want to do and bring to pass, and then we're missing the executive function pieces. So it makes it really difficult because you get mired in the steps. I mean, even the fact that I could get this podcast off the ground was a big deal because there's so many steps. It isn't just, I love the interviews. Okay. The interviews are easy. That's the passionate part. That's the fun part. But then what? Where do you host your podcast? How do you edit your podcast? Do you market your podcast? Like there's just all these executive function steps that I think can get in the way of the passion that people have for whatever their idea is. And so being able to have hope that like you could get good at those executive function pieces, they could become something that you could do so that you could continue with the business that you have and potentially create other businesses. I have a brother that's absolutely a serial entrepreneur. Like he was first audited by the IRS. Am I telling his dirty secrets? I am. And he's highly Googleable. Like there's a lot out there for him. But when he was 17, because he was a DJ and he made a lot of money DJing for churches and high school dances and such. And I don't think he paid any taxes originally. And so mm -hmm. that that became noticed way back when. And he But that's also part of getting good at business is. Now you've got it like, hey, I had this idea and now I'm making money. Now, how do I turn it into like legitimate business and pay taxes and all those next steps? Like you've got to get good at each step to be able to make it a viable option so that you're not getting audited. <laughs> yes. And he and he has done that. I mean, he's yeah. gone forward. He they sold one of his businesses to HP years ago. He's a co-founder of Stance Socks, if you're aware of them. He was the chairman of the board of School Candy, like some major you know, different things. He does a lot more with venture capital now, but he's still on the board at lots of areas. So definitely a serial entrepreneur. And to my knowledge, he's never been diagnosed with ADHD, but I think I think I see some of it. I'm like, maybe it's both of us, but, <laughs> but he's gotten good at business. He's got good at those other pieces, which have allowed him to go from thing to thing and be successful. And not everyone has been as wildly successful as the others. You know, that I think that that is part of being a serial entrepreneur. Not everything is going to go gold. Well, so, that's why that's why I added the addendum to keep of keep going, because yeah. what is getting you going now can be the launch pad for the next thing. So I have ownership in four unique companies and it's fascinating to see what we do to build and grow one company within three to four months. There's a similar option within the next company where I'm like, oh, completely different industry, completely different thing. But if we actually applied what we learned here to here, this would help this grow. And same thing with the third company. And then the fourth is my coaching company. And so we're looking at media and tech, manufacturing, and healthcare. Very different industries in the first three companies I'm an owner in. And then there's my business, which is business coaching. And it's amazing because not only do the things that across those three 
other companies, not only are the things that we are building out also supportive and being like, oh, I could pull that over here and I could pull this over here. And we did this, but if we edit it and tweak it just slightly, it actually would help boost this business. It also supports my coaching business where I can say, oh yeah, in my healthcare company, because you're a healthcare person, this is what we're doing. And then they can learn and grow from that. And so that's the all ships rise community mentality, but it really is the things that you are doing here today will support where you're going to end up over and over and over again. Like I used to be a wedding planner in my early 20s and I loved it. And then I moved and I was like, what do I actually love about this? And it was like, I love the marketing. So that's how I got my career in corporate in marketing and operations. But I learned all of that from running my own business as a wedding planner. And now I host events and I know all the things that I'm not afraid to host an event because I know how to host events because I've been a wedding planner and I know how to pull all the pieces together. So something that I did years ago has complete relevance to what I do now, even if I'm not doing it same thing verbatim. And even so my podcast, I went to college for broadcast communication. I was the general manager of my college radio station had one of the top radio shows with my co-host. And when it came years and years later to do a podcast, I was like, oh, I don't have a problem with that. I can edit it. I have no problem being on camera or speaking and worried about how my voice sounds or anything like that. I have no, none of those problems because I'd been trained and had that experience years before. And so the things that you're doing now in business and in life have every chance to be applicable to wherever it is you end up going or to the multiple places that you end up going. So I love that for your brother. I love it for me. And I love it for everybody listening because it is so true and so relevant. And so if you can look at things and going, yeah, I'm just always learning and growing. And how can I apply what I have learned and how I've grown to what I'm doing now? That will always take you to those next steps and you will naturally get good at whatever it is that you're doing. I love that. Well, and I think it's applicable even to people who are just starting out and think I have no experience. I don't know how to do that. For example, because of the the areas that I end up in a lot and with a lot of women who have been stay-at-home moms for a lot of years. And they're like, so I don't have any skills. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Do you know the skill level that it takes to run this family to make sure that everyone is fed and to where the places they're supposed to go and learn how to do the different homework pieces and to interact with the different teachers and coaches. And what, like, do you know how many life skills come out from being a stay-at-home mom if you're doing it, like to the best of your ability? You absolutely have applicable skills to business. You know, I, I at one point many years ago before my husband went to law school, he lost his job unexpectedly and we had two little kids and I was an elementary school teacher by trade, but I wasn't willing to put my kids in daycare. No judgment for the people who do. At that time, that did not work for me. So I went to work at a Denny's. I had never been a server. I had a college degree. Some of the people were not happy to have me be hired because they wanted more hours. But because of my background, I was an exceptional server. I made way more money than everyone else working at that Denny's. At that time, I made great tips because I remembered all of the little things and I knew how to handle that. The little things like, I do want a glass of milk, but I want it with my meal. You know, not don't bring it at the before or after. I want it right with my meal. Just all of those little kind of pieces that you remember. And so the skills, I love the message that you're sending, whatever skills that you're acquiring from whatever your life experiences, whether they are business or not business related, can then be applied to business. So if you have an idea and you're like, you know, I have this great idea, I think I could be an entrepreneur, but maybe I can't because I don't know the actual details of business you still have skills that are applicable and you can learn the details that you don't have yet and you can still do it and you can still be successful and there's still a place for you and don't count yourself out because the only way you're going to fail is if you just count yourself out and and you don't put the effort in and you don't move forward with it. So if there's something on your heart, go for it. You can do it. And Taylor, tell us more about how people can find you, how they can connect with you. They could use your business coaching because maybe there is someone listening thinking, well, I kind of have this idea, but I'm stuck and I don't know what to do next. And I'd love to be part of this community you're building. I'd love to be able to dial into that. 
How do they find you? How do they connect and use your services? Yeah. So if you go to getgoodatbusiness.com, that is my website and where all things happen. <laughs> and if you are an entrepreneur or you're thinking of starting, one of the things that I love to offer is a business audit and strategy session utilizing the iMove methodology, which we've talked about briefly here today. And in that, we go through each area of your business within iMove. And then from there, we're able to actually craft a 90-day plan to help you really get the momentum and achieve those next steps and next milestones in your business. So if that's something that sounds interesting and intriguing, or maybe like, hey, I kind of want to figure out these things, I would highly suggest going to getgoodatbusiness.com and then check out getting a business audit and strategy session. Well, that sounds amazing. And then I'm sure that from there, if you know they want additional coaching services or whatever, you navigate all of that to say, here are the next steps of how I can help you more. And if you're like, hey, I just want to follow on social media or listen to a podcast, everything is under Get Good at Business or Taylor Proctor, but Get Good at Business should get you where you need to go. <laughs> and that is the name of your podcast as well, which I'm sure can be found on any of the places that anyone's looking for a podcast. But you also are on YouTube as well and, and do Facebook Lives with your podcast. Yes. So I, I do interview, speaking of community, so I believe in all ships rising. So one of the things that we're doing in my business community now is we have a Facebook group that's free to join and also free interviews with other entrepreneurs across a variety of different business models and industries so that we can all learn like what's working in one industry. Maybe you've never thought of for yourself and you're like, that's actually genius. And I could totally apply it to my business. There's opportunities to learn and to grow from each other, have that community. And it's called the Get Good at Business. Big surprise there. Get Good at Business Facebook group. And so if you go on Facebook and you type in Get Good at Business, search under groups, it should be the first thing to pull up. Would love to have anyone listening join so that they can all connect together, network to, together, as well as watch our live interviews, even participate in being on as an interviewee. Uh, we'd love to have that as well. That sounds perfect. I love that. Well, I have loved this conversation so much. I had no idea what, you know, how, how <laughs> what we were going to connect about just because I don't know you super well. And I feel like I started this podcast and that it has possibilities to become a business, but I am not clear on how or when or why that would be. So like, how are we, what are we going to talk about business here? But it's been awesome. And I've learned so much and I've loved seeing the threads of community in and out of your life. And just again, being able to see how these principles of community building just transfer everywhere across okay. all different life experiences. And how, when we really just sit down and talk to each other face to face, how we're always more alike than we realize even though we have that diversity of passion or diversity of life experience or diversity of race or identity in any way, how much at the heart of it, people just grow when we see each other and just have that moment. So I so appreciate your time and all that you've shared with our listeners and to our listeners, thank you for being part of the Solidarity Sister community. We needed you. Solidarity.